So welcome back to uh, our program for our second speaker. Um, if you're in, the, if you're in the right place, if you're interested in biological control. So Carol Glenister is our next speaker, and she's the founding president of IPM Laboratories, Inc., a 40-year-old company that supplies beneficial insects, mites, and nematodes used for pest control in greenhouses, interior scapes, landscapes, and agriculture. Her research focuses on creating supportive plant habitats for these natural enemies. She has a master's degree in entomology from Cornell University. So you can tell from the first talk, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that knowing, knowing what you're seeing is important. Um, Carol's gonna help you know some other ways to, even if you don't necessarily see the beneficial insects, um, how you know that they're actually working. So Carol, it's all yours. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you so much for having me. Um, when you originally asked me to speak, it was to see, uh, was no, find out what the best beneficial insects were to purchase for the landscape. And I understood that this was um, geared towards the landscape and outdoors. And in general, I don't think it's a good idea to be promoting natural enemies for the garden because there's already many natural enemies working in the garden already. And if they're not there, that's because the habitat's not appropriate to them. So this is a shortened title of a much longer title of how to know if your natural enemies are working. Um, signs is, if you're sci trained in science, it means something specific, but in this case, signs just means and the evidence of natural enemies at work, not just um, the scientific way of what signs mean. So, this is not the slide I expected to be next, but <laughs> I think <laughs> I must have um, deleted the next slide. So the next slide was natural, the natural state of things is um, natural enemies it, it, it's natural control, it's a natural state of things. And one of the hardest things about natural enemies in the landscape is that you actually don't see the pests and you don't see the natural enemies because everything's under natural control. And it was so interesting to see this talk, um, the last talk, Jennifer Taylor's uh, talk about the um, predators making the prey just disappear. The, the deer being less um, abundant just because the predators were around. That, that is uh, that's a wonderful addition to my knowledge because I always thought we had to prove that the predators were eating the prey, but now we can just prove that they're scaring the prey. And indeed, in, naturally in the landscape, that's what really happens is that you just don't see any pests and you don't see any predators. And one of my favorite examples of that is um, um, aphids in the field in pepper fields. Many years ago, I asked uh, a general group of cooperative extension agents, a very large group of extension agents, if they had ever seen aphids in fields of sweet pepper. And there was a big silence. Now the fact of the matter is that in greenhouses, if you have sweet peppers, you have aphids. But outdoors, you don't. And finally, there were two extension agents that said, yes, we have seen outbreaks of aphids in pepper fields that have been sprayed with pesticides. And the indication was that the pepper fields were normally clean because the aphid predators and parasites were taking them all, all out. And the pesticides, which had probably been sprayed for some other pests, had induced the aphid outbreak by killing all those parasites and predators. Now there are many, many, and these would be real, real signs. These pictures are signs of natural enemies. When you actually see the natural enemy, that's a sign. But uh, I'm taking all kinds of other uh, evidence of natural enemies to be signs of natural enemies too, just so you know. This is a little wasp. It's stinging an aphid and it's laying an egg inside, and the egg is going to mature into a 
wasp larva, which will become a wasp adult, and they go spread. That's that. Um, and the wasp adult will chew a hole and crawl out of the aphid mummy and go out, and that adult will lay more eggs if it's a female or make more female if it's a male. Um, so there's all kinds of natural controls occurring out in the field all the time, including in the garden. Um, for example, white flies are really common on squash in the greenhouse because there's no predators or parasites in the greenhouse. Thrips are, can be devastating to peppers, soybeans, and alfalfa in the greenhouse, but we barely see them outdoors. We don't see spider mites in sweet corn, landscape, or soybeans outdoors, usually, sometimes in sweet corn, but not in New York State. Um, but they can be horrible in greenhouses. And that is evidence that the natural enemies are working outdoors. That the, the, the pests are there. It makes it very hard to find them. Um, if you don't have aphids on your landscape plants, apples or your sweet peppers outdoors, is evidence that the natural enemies have taken them out. And my husband is a soybean farmer, and his aphids are controlled every year naturally in the soybean field. He doesn't have to do anything to help the aphids be under control. Alfalfa weevil is under control in alfalfa from a parasite and a fungus that was introduced years ago now. There are a few gypsy moths in those years. When they break out, something let Something fell by the wayside. One of the natural enemies wasn't working. And that's true for many, many forest pests as well. So examples of aphid control that are occurring all the time outdoors in the landscape. Lady beetles, aphid parasites, which you saw that picture out of order. Aphidolides, uh, which we'll have pictures of lace wing larvae and the hoverfly larvae. These are all aphid predators. And parasites. These are aphids. You can tell these are aphids by the tail type. Those two tails, they are also called cornicles. These can be very numerous on many, many plants because the, all the aphids are females and they lay like young, which rapidly produce their own babies. A wonderful picture of an adult lady beetle. It has got an uh, aphid in its mandible and um, it's chowing down. This is a lady beetle larva. You can see it looks very different from the lady beetle. It is also predatory. So the lady beetles are predatory as both adults and as larvae. And if you see them, that means there's a, something going on. If you don't see them, there can still be something going on. But if you, it's a very, very good sign to see a predator or a parasite at all. Here's the aphid mummy that I was trying to describe. It's um, the grown-up aphid which has died and its outer shell has gotten hard and brown. And a wasp that is an adult inside is chewing this hole and it's going to push that hole open like a hatch door and it's going to crawl out. It's an aphid mummy. And that would be a sign of parasitism in the field anytime you see that. And here's the picture or here's a little wasp um, the jaws are, are chewing to come out there. This is the aphid niche. It's only the larva that is predaceous. And what the larvae do is they bite the knee or the, the leg of the aphid and they inject the toxin and then they suck the juices out of the aphid. One of the things that I wanted was to have pictures of sucked out aphids. I believe this is one that's not in focus here, but you can see evidence of these collapsed aphids, and those are evidence that they've been preyed upon. Um, Lacing will cause the same effect, um, and um, that would be another piece of evidence that your aphids were being eaten. Now, this um, is the midge adult. It looks like a mosquito. It's about the size of a mosquito. 
it looks like a fungus gnat too, in, uh, similar insect group. But um, it is not a predator. It doesn't eat insects. There's a lacewing larva. It has its mandibles stuck into this aphid, and it's going to be um, sucking the juices out of the aphid. Harold, could you get a little closer to your microphone? You're a little bit muffled. Okay. Does that help? I think it. I think it's better. Thank you. I'll speak up too. <laughs> My Great, father is deaf, so I'm um, accustomed to that. Thank you. So going backwards now. Okay, so the lacing adult, if you see that, it's a very good sign. It also is not predaceous. It's, it lays eggs, which hatch into the larvae, which are predators, but the lacing adult is not going to be eating. And lastly, we have the hoverfly larva is a predator of aphids. It's a fantastic predator in the landscape. It's not available commercially. And um, if you see it, it, it's a maggot, and it's got clear skin, and you can kind of see the guts inside pumping as they eat. Um, and the, the skin looks a little mucousy and warty. If you see that, um, especially near aphids, you've got a hoverfly larva. And here's the adult. Um, it looks like a bee. It can look like a half a size of bee or a full size of a bee. The full size is just a different species of hoverfly. The small size is another species of hoverfly. They love flowers and they're very attractive to especially this flower, sweet alyssum. They do love lantana as well. This is lantana. But and almost any flower will attract them. Um, it just happens that sweet alyssum is one of their favorites. So ideally in a landscape, both the pets and the natural enemy are barely visible. You just can't see them. It is so hard to do count. Um, one way you can see them is that there are some plants that will pull in pests more than others. And if they have a few pests, it's likely you'll see a predator there or a natural enemy or a parasite. So indicator plants that might tell you of the presence include marigolds, gerberas, peppers, and lantana, eggplant, and tomato. So marigolds will really pull thrips. They'll show spider mites, especially in the greenhouse, white flies. Gerbers are really, really attracted to thrip. Peppers are super attracted uh -huh. to aphids. And um, white flies are really pulled by lantana, eggplant, and tomatoes. So if you look there, you might be lucky to actually see a natural enemy. Otherwise, generally, you see nothing. This is hard. So what you want to look for on those indicator plants, you want to see if there's any pests, you want to see if there's natural enemies. But lastly, I did show you immatures. If you don't see immatures, you see so no sign that the next generation is coming. In the case of lady beetle adults, they're always going to be flying away. They're always going to be going someplace else. Just because you see them doesn't mean that they're there for the next generation. Those immatures are very, very indicative of a continuing natural enemy population. Since natural enemies are so rare, how are you ever going to find them? Um, you, you almost have to be able to look at the whole plant very fast. You can't look one leaf at a time. Another thing you can do is you can um, take a, a white board or a clipboard with a piece of white paper and bang or tap a handful of the plants or the flowers on the white paper and look to see what you see. You need to do bulk samples. You can't do little bitty bitty uh, observations. Uh, but there is one place where you can do a, a very specific observation, and that is in pepper flowers. You can look into the ind individual pepper flowers and, and look for uh, something that I'm going to be describing later and do count on, on those. So uh, we have a really great question, and it's perfect with the picture you just pulled up. It says uh -huh. marigolds are supposed to be good companion plants, but if they pull in pests, then why are they praised as good companion plants? I love that question. 
that feeds right into the difference between a marigold in the greenhouse. You see these thrips of uh, flex. These are not thrips. These are the damage from thrips. And I, this is horrible damage, horrible. They're little brown lines and dots. And that is from the thrips. Has anybody ever seen damage like that on a marigold plant outdoors? I haven't. Um, marigolds don't have thrips outdoors. Not many anyway. And I'll, I'm going to go to that in, a, in just a brief moment. But um, just to give you an example, those plants that I said would be indicators, those are the best pullers in greenhouses that I know. I cannot come up with better pullers. I, they're pulling pests. But in that landscape, hmm, um, generally it doesn't happen. To, they don't get out of control. They, they might show the uh, pest or two, but they're not going to show very many. So this is one of my favorite predators. It's called Aurea. This is the adult here. This is the nymph here. And we've spent a lot of time looking for adults and nymphs, especially in flowers and in peppers. Um, and these particular ones are on marigold flower petals. Now, it's important to know that Aureus absolutely adores peppers, flowers. It adores pepper flowers probably more. Well, maybe, no, I'm not sure it adores them more than marigolds. Nobody ever tested that. But as much as marigolds, anyway. This is a lantana plant from a greenhouse. These are all clean leaves here, but this one is just totally infested with white flies. And this lantana plant pulled in all these white flies from the greenhouse, and then we released a parasite. And this is the result. There's seven out of nine of those white fly immatures have been killed by Encarcia. And these are parasitized white fly immatures. There's a hole where the wasp crawled out. This, the black ones are parasitized. This one, a white fly adult emerged from successfully. And I think this one also, a white fly adult, but everything else was killed by the white, the white fly parasite. You're very unlikely to see this in the landscape in this, this particular thing. So it's just an example of control. So this is one of my favorite stories. I, some of you've heard this before, but um, this is real world counts of aureus and thrips in flower garden, a variety trial garden in uh, Ontario. And what I did was I went around and I struck a white, uh, it was a spiral notebook with these flowers from all those different varieties. And I sampled 10 bunches of flowers um, from each variety. And I counted the aureus and the thrips, and I also counted the aureus and thrips nymphs, but I, I consolidated it all into this graph. Um, the, these are per flower. So I uh, also adjusted it. I counted the number of flowers in the sample. And I adjusted all these data to the number of flowers. So here with the petunia, I only saw one thrip in 10 flowers. And then on pentas, I saw three aureus and three thrips on 10 flowers. That's a lot of sampling. Osteospermum, I saw 10 thrips and 10 aureus on 10 flowers. And two different marigolds, one marigold I saw just one point, probably five aureus and no thrips on those 10 flowers and the other, other one, three aureus and three thrips on 10 flowers. So the point here is there was less than one thrip per flower generally. Um, aureus was almost twice as frequent as the thrips and Jennifer's talk makes me wondering if they were scaring the thrips now. Um, there were a maximum of two aureus observed per sample and an average of one aureus per three samples. 
This is in a flower garden in August. August is Aureus's best time of year. It's going to be high December there. And there were no thrips in one of the Aureus flowers it had in the Florida. And so, so uh, you should be able to find Aureus in August, especially if you want to try to find, look, in June you might have a little trouble, but if you're going to see them at all, I would go to Pepper. But, and after doing this work, someone told me that they wanted to control thrips in their pepper field because they had a horrible problem and, and I personally couldn't understand it because peppers are such good hosts of worries that I never heard of thrips outbreaks in peppers like that before. So uh, Mark Siddle of Amos Siddle and Sons had had to spray his pepper field five times the previous year um, and he wanted to try Aureus in those pepper fields. And I said, well, maybe if we could get Aureus started early with marigold, fully, uh, get before the peppers went into flower, maybe we could do, get the, make assure that the Aureus would get started. And we set up two years of studies. And um, I just have to say that with five sprays, he was having eight to 18 thrips per pepper blossom in 2010. And um, remember, I just showed you in flowers, which are very, very prone to thrips in greenhouses, all those flowers in the flower trial, um, that I couldn't even find one thrips per flower generally. So this was very stark. So Mark, wanted, we, we set up a series of uh, tests and one of the things we we're gonna do is assure that there were aureus in those pepper fields from the get-go. And we were gonna do that with these marigolds. And um, we were gonna introduce aureus onto the marigolds and also hope for natural colonization from the hedgerows by aureus naturally um, in those pepper fields. One of the main things that uh, Mark did was he assured that there were no orthene sprays in, for aphid control in the greenhouse. Remember, aphids are very, very common on peppers in the greenhouse. And one of his growers had the previous season sprayed with orthene on the peppers for aphids um, in order to not have aphids on those peppers. And apparently from our future work, um, that orthene had persisted in the field and had killed his original aureus. And once he got started spraying, he never could catch up because the natural enemies never came into the field. So here are the marigolds. And um, remember, I told you peppers are fabulous insectary plants for aureus. aureus loves peppers and predatory mites also thrive in pepper flowers as well um, and since peppers are so good at growing aphids the natural enemies do really well in, in pepper fields also although it's hard to see them because there's so few aphids um, it's much easier to see orion just briefly this is the Aureus numbers per beet sample that in 2011. And these are the Aureus in the peppers in 2011. And you can see there's about a two week lag in the Aureus colonizing the peppers versus the marigolds. And the reason is that the peppers did not have flowers until here. But once they had flowers, it almost there was almost no reason to have the miracles there. And here is another uh, graph that I'll just show you the thrips numbers. They went up and then they leveled off. And it's less than one per flower. Here's one per flower. We were doing per flower samples. And here's the aureus numbers and they shot up to more than one per flower. 
kind of like you saw in the miracles in the Stokes Cave trial. Um, so suffice it to say, they had less than one per flower. They didn't have eight to 18 thrips like when they were spraying. They had less than one thrips per flower. They were very well satisfied with their control. And they did not persist with the marigolds because it was obvious that all you had to do <coughs> was get the, the peppers blooming and the aureus would take off and you had to just not kill the aureus with that orthene which is good stomach in the plants and it persists for a long time and it transplanted out into the field with the with the peppers you have a question here um on oops um that all the subject plants that you're talking about are non-natives and are, do you know of any research that's been done on predators or parasitoids on native plants it looks like maybe Amara answered that also. Um, oh, okay. What's what's non-native? So um, Amara, that most of the plants you're talking about are non-natives. Amara put oh, in yeah, information yeah. that you can find aureus on um, blue lobelia, culver's root, goldenrod, hairy beard tongue, wild bergamot, and anise hyssop. So, oh, but, I, but I have to add that aureus is native to the United States. It, right. It, the original aureus was shipped to Europe for them to start using it, aureus and sidiosis, um, many years ago, and then shipped back here as some production lab. Um, it, it was shipped from Georgia, uh, but then they realized that they had their own aureus in Europe, and then they stopped using the, uh, the non-native aureus, but uh, aureus is native to the U.S., and the question is, where does it naturally overwinter? I would say it's in those hedgerows. I would sure love to know what the best overwintering sites are. And then Nancy also asks, are aureus able to bite humans? Yes, I've been bitten by aureus, but it's not much. Um, they, some, they... some people have a bad reaction. There's not very many people, but some people get well similar. Do they? Okay. Yeah. And, and, and Amara added that you'd probably get, they'll attract uh, and some support my new pyre bugs are aureus, even if um, even if you didn't apply them. Yep, yep, and that they did not need to apply those aureus in those pepper fields. There was such a huge natural population surrounding the mm -hmm. field. Um, that was another thing. The fields were were not larger than ten acres. I think there was a seven acre field, plenty of hedgerows, and so those aureus, um, there were probably more on the hedgerows than we ever released. And the outcome on those, that one of those studies was that um, there was one aureus for every two pepper flowers in the entire field. And um, the growers before that did not know that they had such this resource. They did not know that all they had to do was protect the aureus. Um, and now they do, so they're, it's better. Another place that I love to detect natural enemies in the field is on vines that are prone to spider mites or any plant for that matter. Um, so for example, ivy. Ivy is extremely prone to spider mites in the greenhouse. Outdoors, you try to find spider mites on ivy, good luck. But what you might see is a little area on an ivy leaf. This is the best picture I had. I, I don't have a good picture of what I want to say. Just a little area, one centimeter in diameter, just a little area of stippling. This is spider mite damage showing up from the top of the leaf and nothing else on that leaf, just a little area. You turn the leaf over and you try to find spider mites and there's nothing there. And you can go leaf to leaf, maybe every 20, 50 leaves, I've, and somebody that's good at scanning leaves can scan 20 or 50 leaves quickly, very quickly. Spot those spider mite stipples, turn the leaf over, see if there's any spider mites. If you're really, really lucky, you'll see a predator running around or you'll see some dead spider mites. But as a general rule, all you're going to see is that little bit of stippling. So we have a lot of predators out there in the field. Californicus is one. Uh, really, that's more... I'm not so sure it's common in the east. Uh, we do sell it in the east, so Phalasis is a native right there, and Feltiella is a native. 
Spelltail is a predator that's not a predatory mite. Fallacious is this mite here. Um, that's persimilis. It's not native, and I was supposed to take that out, and I didn't. This is a little tiny maggot that's spider mite size, and it's called Spelltail. It's predatory as a larva, not as an adult. And um, if you're lucky, you might see a cocoon of that. It's white and fuzzy, and I wish I had included a picture. It's a wonderful sign in the field of, um, of, of natural enemies at work. And uh, ideally, though, you're just going to, you're, it'll be so hard for you to find these that it's almost not worth looking, except maybe on a, an indicator plant. You might be able to pull it off. Ivy is one of my indicator plants. Many Dutchman's pipe, many of these vines are in good indicators. Another thing, you, if you're really lucky, you might see a, a spider mite or predatory mite egg. It's a big egg. This is a spider mite egg. It's longer than it's wide, and it's about four times the size of a spider mite egg. This is the spider mite. There's spider mite egg. This is a non-native predator, and it's egg nearby. It's very large in relation to the size of the predator. It's a good indication of the fact that you might need a hand lens because those are small. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will wear high level reading glasses like 2.5 or 3 magnification reading glasses so I can scan a large area very quickly. And if I'm looking for predators, I'm looking for a fast running mite. And then once I see it, then I go with a hand lens because you cannot cover enough area with a hand lens, but once you find something of interest, the hand lens is going to be very helpful. Okay, so one of the ways to protect your natural enemies in the field that you can't see because they're so rare is to stay away from long residual pesticides. And that would include things like orthene, seven, marathon, imidacloprid, and telstar or any of the pyrethroids. Um, these have such long residuals, they are legendary in causing pest outbreaks by killing natural enemies. So we have several biocontrol strategies. As you can see, I'm talking about caring for your own natural enemies through conservation biocontrol. You can also grow your own natural enemies um, in a variety of ways, but I'm not talking about that today. You can buy them, um, but as a general rule, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to be purchasing them for most landscapes. If you want, have to use pesticides, you want to use a selective pesticide. Um, there are, you, you want to, insect growth regulators are helpful. A natural pyrethrum, just in one spot where you need it. Don't put them everywhere. Um, Captain Jacks is used quite a bit, but once again, minimize the area that you're treating. Captain Jacks is going to kill all kinds of parasitic wasps uh, for a short term, a short period of time. And um, conserve your hedgerows. Try to keep some wild areas going and plant some insectary plants, which is a lead in to Amara's talk, which um, should be quite wonderful on growing and sectary planting for supporting natural enemies. And Amara, just on that same topic, she put in the chat, there's a link for some research that she did about which plants support which natural enemies. <clears throat> and so um, you can download that and, or, and you know, keep, keep track of what you're putting in your garden to help with attracting the natural enemies. Okay. Here's an example of an insectary planting in a 2000 um, lettuce field, the, the year 2000, 21 years ago, 22. Um, they don't do this anymore because they figured out that they could just insert uh, sweet alyssum between the lettuce and not do a 20th of their acre to sweet alyssum. Um, there's another, but the sweet alyssum was to pull in the hoverflies, the hoverflies, which I talked about earlier in the talk. And sweet alyssum would be a wonderful annual insectary plant for you to add to your garden. There's the hoverfly larva again. 
those are very, very important in the landscape for controlling aphids. So hopefully we um, have done a little bit to develop another generation of plant detectives. Um, it's, it's tough to find them in the field, but um, the first thing that if you really want to become a good plant detective, it's going to be important to know the life cycles of the natural enemies so you know how to look for the different stages of them, the eggs, the larvae, and the adults. And over, our, uh, over lunchtime, we're going to have um, uh, some identification pictures so that you can learn some more of your beneficials. Um, because that's one of the, the big pieces of it. And, uh, okay. Uh, any questions? Thank you. I'm going to mute John for a second while we have some questions. And then John can get his talk up. If you if you can stop sharing, Carol, while any more questions come in. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, got it. Oops. Um, Sweet Alyssum is in the Brassica family. Have you ever heard of seen issues where Brassica insect pests like cabbage aphids build up on sweet alyssum. I have never seen cabbage aphids on sweet alyssum. Now there, there will be maybe a few reasons for that. Um, I have not studied uh, cabbage aphids in detail, but they seem to be a problem in the fall, not the spring. And we're really more focused towards the spring. Has anybody seen cabbage aphids on sweet alyssum? But it's a good point that it, it's in the breast, it's in the mustard family. It, mm -hmm. And uh, I think that mustard weeds are probably also really good hover fly um, support, you know, any of the mustard weeds. So one of the things we're not thinking about, you know, you have to have some pests um, in order to have the, the beneficials because there has to be something them, for them to eat. So we're never really trying to get rid of absolutely everything. Um, because then, there, you know, I don't stick around if there's nothing to eat either, frankly. <clears throat> so, um, you know, something where you might have a few. And, and one of the things I think that you've been saying, and it goes back to the question about marigolds as, as good companion plants, is you need a place for the, the beneficials to feed. So if you've got a plant that pulls in thrips or aphids, then it also pulls in the beneficials and it kind of keeps any damage that you might find in that area and sort of so I've been reading about this concept of push-pull um, beneficial use of beneficials, and it's the pull to bring them into certain plants that might even be used as a trap crop. Um, so I noticed in the chat, I wondered if sweet alyssum should not be used to support natural enemies in brassica vegetables. Now, I've encouraged people to try this many times, and um, I have to say that I have not had positive feedback. The main focus is cabbage aphid control on Brussels sprouts. Cabbage hmm. aphid causes horrible damage to Brussels sprouts in the autumn. And it seems, I get the feeling, I mean, I don't have any data, but my feeling is that hoverflies quit in the fall because nobody has come back with a wonderful story about cabbage aphid control. They're spraying, They're, they, they have no choice. Um, and I wish we did have a good solution for cabbage aphid control in the fall. I, I would like to in, investigate a parasitoid for cabbage aphid. Great, thanks. Thanks, Carol. 